an exponential organization is an organization that, that by the design of it keeps the entire organization in a flow state. What does it take to do the impossible? What does it take to level up your game like never before? What does it take for individuals, for organizations, for even institutions to achieve paradigm shifting? Nothing is ever the same again, breakthroughs. Our mission is to decode the neurobiology of flow and cognitive peak performance. Access the minds of maverick scientists, groundbreaking innovators, and world-leading experts to understand what it takes to achieve ultimate human performance. So you can feel your best, perform your best, and accomplish your boldest goals. I'm your host, Rian Doris, and together with best-selling author Stephen Kotler, I present to you Flow Research Collective Radio. Hi, hey everybody. I want to take a moment to introduce each of our guests, but the topic at hand today is going to be exponential technology, entrepreneurship, and navigating entrepreneurship amidst great uncertainty, and innovation, and lots of other topics that I'm sure will naturally spiral off those. Jane is an entrepreneur and executive across many industries. She's incredibly experienced in harnessing new ideas to lead creative, mission-driven organizations. Our current focus, which hopefully she'll tell us a little more about, is how technology is pushing the frontiers of biology forward. And with that, she launched Neolife, which is an online magazine in order to capture the stories driving a neurobiological revolution, or neobiological revolution. And Jane was the co-founder and former president of Wired Magazine previously, and she also was the president of, is it TCHO Chocolate, Jane? Chocolate. Oh. Just say Cho. It's like the first show. That's what I was talking about. Yeah, yeah. Cho so rolls off the mouth a little easier. Um, and yeah, I'd love if you could tell us about that as well. Uh, and yeah, Jane is just amazing, and we're extremely grateful to have her join us here today. And finally, we've got Salim Ismail as well. And Salim has been building disruptive digital companies as a serial entrepreneur since the early 2000s. He's a futurist. He's a best-selling author of a book, I'm sure, many of you have read called Exponential Organizations and Another Exponential Transformation. And Salim is the founding executive director of Singularity University, which pretty much our entire audience knows of as well through Peter Diamandis, who is Stephen's co-author. And Salim is also the co-founder and chairman of Open EXO, which hopefully Salim will be able to tell us a little more about. And Salim has founded and led some of the most influential tech companies at the foundation of our digital society. He led Yahoo's idea incubator, Brickhouse, and is an ex-prize foundation board member. And Salim also co-founded the Fast Track Institute, addressing the most pressing problems faced by cities today. I know Stephen wants to kick us off with a question. Hey, everybody. Welcome back. It's really good to be with you guys again. This is sort of the other half of the work I've been doing. I've spent most of my career studying those moments in time when the impossible becomes possible. And I always say, whenever you see that, you tend to see people harnessing disruptive technology and people extending human capability. And we've spent the past three weeks really talking about the human capability side, flow, peak performance, that sort of stuff. On the other side, I thought we'd take a disruptive technology approach. And the place I wanted to kind of kick us off with is last time we were together, I talked about um, how what we're seeing is sort of the whole planet united against a common enemy. And for the very first time in history, we're seeing an exponential solutions being applied to uh, an exponential problem. And that's really kind of where I wanted to start the discussion with, you know, Jane, with what you're seeing in Symbio, uh, Salim has been working both with nations and with companies to really get them ready for the digital age and, and sort of future-proof them. But he's immersed deeply in the tech world as well. And I just want to see what are you guys seeing that's blowing your mind that's emerging today? You know, the joke I made last week is Peter and I wrote a book called The Future is Faster Than You Think, and the future is a lot faster than we thought, right? That what's <laughs> happened has sort of absolutely turbo boost you know we, we we talked about how healthcare was going to get reinvented over the next decade i think it's going to be reinvented over the next year year and a half and a bunch of other stuff so i wanted to just take a moment to pause and what are you guys seeing salim why don't we start with you and then we'll jump to jane so from a technological perspective i think uh two things one is uh it's clear that uh you know that we spent a decade trying to teach leaders about exponentials and the difference between linear to exponential 
Uh, and what's amazing is you look at the reaction to COVID and how different countries have embraced it. You can see the ones that understand exponentials and the ones that don't. And it's not a great way of learning about it, but I guess now everybody in the world knows about doubling patterns, at least, and they can see it happening going from zero to 100 to 1,000, all of a sudden you're at 100,000 and you didn't know how you were there. So I think that's a key uh, point that gives us now a baseline to work off. Uh, I think, um, uh, Stephen, your, co your comment about we have a common enemy for the first time is really interesting and a powerful place. I think we have spent 300 years connecting ourselves economically. We have economic interdependence and capitalism driving most of the world forward, but we haven't connected ourselves culturally, uh, biologically, spiritually, tri tribally. We're still multiple tribes uh, and we are rife with tribal thinking. And I think the work to do now is to break down tribalism which worked great in a scarcity world, but doesn't work great in an abundance world. Uh, and so I think that's the work to do. And how, and I'm really fascinated by how we, we would use uh, what's coming to do that. There are three technologies that I think are profoundly interesting for the next decade or two. The first is solar energy, because that gives us abundance in, in uh, uh, energy, and that makes lots of other things easy. And even if it doesn't cover the base load, it'll drive the price down to make it widely available in a broad way. The second, I think, is uh, blockchain uh, because it allows us to create and create systems of that are trustless. And all of our institutions are built to for mistrust and protect against mistrust. And yet now we have an ability to to build into the infrastructure trust. And we now have mechanisms like Uber or eBay where we know how to scale trust. What would that look like? And I think the third uh, would be the incredible advances in in brain imaging and biosensing and the, and the bio world, CRISPR and others, that give us unbelievable capabilities in uh, navigating and figuring out who we wanna be. That's a fascinating response. Um, <laughs> that's why I love asking Salim questions. I never, I never get the answer I'm expecting. Trust technologies, tribalism, great answer. Jane, what do you think? Well, I have a far more prosaic um, uh, answer to that. Um, but one of the things that I think is really interesting that I have been seeing in uh, the life sciences and the place where engineering and biology intersect uh, is this incredible pivot. Just how quickly companies have gone from doing, you know, cancer vaccine research to, you know, deploying completely new tools and skills to go after a completely new target. And um, I'm really, really blown away by that. You know, you talk to companies that might have been shut down because what they were doing was not considered essential business, who have now made themselves into the very center of um, our solutions to the pandemic. I mean, we, uh, I could talk like this morning, there was a, a town hall with uh, Illumina, who are the makers, uh, the largest makers of uh, genome sequencing technology. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the applications for that have just quadrupled. Um, the demand for that has quadrupled. Um, you know, we're looking at the various tools of synthetic biology. Um, so once we can read the genome, you know, how what can we do to actually edit and write the genome um, in new ways? So how can we synthesize, you know, little segments of the um, of the genome of the virus uh, in order to propagate that to all of the researchers so that they can start doing targeting and, and testing and so forth? I mean, the holy grail is um, diagnostics, right? Diagnostics and testing, treatment and vaccines. And so literally all of the tools of, um, of the life sciences are being used now in one way or another um, for those applications. Uh, and I can tell you about a bunch of different companies that are doing things, you know, both from a, a technology point of view and also from a, an investment standpoint. Um, because every day there's another announcement, including there's a company that does um, basically instead of making wine from grapes and sake from rice, they basically get the aromatics of those and then use the molecules to build from scratch uh, the same flavors that you would get without having to harvest or ferment or distill those things. And so, you know, that's kind of fun and interesting. And uh, and so they, of course, have now pivoted along with all the other alcohol manufacturers to doing hand sanitizers. Um, right. You know, we were joking earlier about the, uh, the cancer vaccine researchers in Kentucky who are now uh, switching to figure out how to use the tobacco plant as a mechanism for, um, for growing and, uh, and creating a vaccine. So um, I would say the 
the technologies that I talk about, what I refer to as like the neobiological technologies, which is like sequencing and big data, uh, you know, neural networks, imaging, you know, and then of course all of the networks for distributing all of that information, all of those technologies are getting a huge boost of, mm -hmm. um, of interest, of investment, new ways of applying them, you know, to this new outcome. But then on top of that, we have all these other technologies that are now being turned, all these other manufacturers, you know, whether it's the molecular um, spirit manufacturer or whether it's, you know, Haynes that instead of doing, you know, pull-ups is now going to be doing masks. Um, so it's this retooling of, of everything that's super interesting. You know, I used to do synthetic biology research for cancer vaccines. Now I'm studying COVID. You know, it's just, you hear that all the way down the line and it's, it's a fascinating time. Mm -hmm. Let me ask you both one more follow-up question on this, because I've heard this a couple of times and I want I want to I said if anything, I've heard it coming out of the SU community, which is for where we are technologically. And I don't think this applies to something like Ebola. If we were up against an Ebola kind of kind of virus, especially if it was airborne. Um, but a lot of people have said that this particular kind of, of pandemic crisis is for where the technology is fairly low hanging fruit. And that 10 years from now, once we can get full body simulation done on the back end, and get the testing stuff integrated into our smartphones on the front end, this actual, the problem that we're dealing with is a very, like, it's not that it's not dire and awful, but it's very short lived in, in our technological history because of where we are. Do you think there's truth to that? Do you think it's overreaching? Do you think it's underreaching? What do you guys think? So I <laughs> spent a lot of time with people in um, the pharmaceutical industry, people who work in the um, healthcare field, work in hospitals, um, work in research institutions. And, you know, I've been asking all of them for the last three or four or five years, you know, how long until this revolution, so these tools that we see and are working with actually make a difference. You know, there's this horrific metric that people use, which is the amount of time it takes to get a solution, whether that's a drug or a procedure or some kind of uh, medical technical device, whatever, from um, proof in the lab to the patient, like all the way through the process of um, uh, clinical trials and approval. And um, then, you know, dissemination, get, you have to have the billing code approved by the insurance company uh, until it actually filters out to, you know, the practitioner in Des Moines, you know, at your family practice, family health practice. And so what I'm interested in are, you know, how are ways to completely shred the $3.6 trillion healthcare industry, which is serving us so badly, which has diminishing returns every year, and, and build an alternate universe where smart tools and efficient use of resources are deployed, where preventive technologies help uh, and predictive technologies help us um, not get sick in the first place? And, you know, how are we going to do that? And, you know, literally, one person after another has said it's not going to happen. You know, the incentives are so crosswired. Um, it's not that one particular industry is more evil than another. By the way, pharmaceutical companies are no more evil than insurance companies who are no more evil than, you know, hospital administrators who are no more evil. And by the same token, they're not necessarily more angelic either. You know, it's everybody's doing what they're designed to do. It's just their incentives put them at odds with each other. And so, you know, people said, honestly, it's going to take a war or a revolution or, you know, some kind of, you know, political coup or, you know, some massive thing to change anything. Otherwise, we're just going to keep driving into this oblivion. And lo and behold, we have a global pandemic. And this is a tremendous opportunity, which is a horrible thing to say. I have a friend, you know, who's been in the IC all, all week, you know, on a ventilator. So it's not like I'm being facetious about this. It's, it's hit home very hard, but this is a huge opportunity. You know, just the sim simple fact that, you know, telehealth services have been approved by the FDA and are going through the roof. You know, it's sort of that that great internet meme where, you know, people have been, uh, oh, it turns out we could have done that with a phone call after all, you know, or could have right. done that by email after all. We didn't need a meeting. We didn't have to get on the plane. You know, it's like same thing. We don't have to go sit in the hospital and doctor's offices where we are more likely to catch, you know, sepsis or, you know, some other airborne uh, virus. So telehealth is exploding, which is super exciting. You know, the approval process, 
you know, granted, I think there's some shortcuts that are being taken, which may not ultimately prove to be in the best interests of everybody. But I think we've learned at least some of the easiest low hanging fruit in terms of things, obstacles we can just bat out of the way now, you know, to just get faster to our target. So, yeah, I think this is an extraordinary opportunity to move very, very quickly to make massive changes that could save billions of dollars and, you know, hopefully millions of lives. Salim? So when I've talked to people about this, uh, and I'm getting a more optimistic response in a bunch of ways. I, I really like uh, the framing about from Jane that this is a huge opportunity. And when I've talked to the virologists and so on, they're like bubbling with excitement because we get to test and play with systems. In the grand scheme of things, COVID is not that big of a threat. And yet it's completely crippled the global economy, right? And so we have to look at that and say, okay, we need to design ourselves to be way, way, way more resilient than we are today. And so we're kind of thinking about, starting to think about that. And we think of this, you know, the global super tankers had to suddenly crawl to a halt. And now that it's crawled to a halt, we have the opportunity to turn it. And woe betide us if we don't take that opportunity and, and take do the work to turn it. Um, I think the, the positive outcomes that I'm hearing is, A, it'll give us that chance to do that. Uh, but more importantly, with the medical and healthcare breakthroughs that are coming, that basically we'll be able to handle, handle pandemics uh, in over the next five to seven years, uh, because the speed at which uh, a vaccine information or how to fight this thing, et cetera, um, can be found much more quickly. And that moves at the speed of an email versus the a pandemic, which moves at a speed of a plane flight, right? And then gestation period, et cetera. Um, it's completely fascinating to me watching how Taiwan dealt with this uh, versus other countries. In Taiwan, they had 1,800 teams of five people each tracking down every single person that came in from China and were they in, who were they in contact with, testing them, et cetera. And they have a literally zero cases of the, the coronavirus. And so we have these opportunities and these abilities to learn, build the proper systems. But from a healthcare perspective, as Jane mentioned, we have amazing possibilities with uh, advanced vaccinations. So you mentioned a really interesting point, Salim, which is you know how different things are managed in different countries. I think there's another big opportunity here too, which is, um, you know, for the first time, these 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 uh, medical systems, healthcare systems, are um, country specific, and they are, you know, we have the um, the the Surgeon General, you know, and it's like it's it's a military grade command structure <clears throat> that is controlled by the chief executive of every country. And, you know, just like an organization, uh, a, a corporate organization, they have talking points, they have goals they're trying to reach, they have investors they're trying to, um, you know, a, attract. And as a result, you know, their reporting figures go through, you know, the corporate communications, you know, before they're released. And what we're seeing now with this, this pandemic is those layers are getting flattened. I mean, right. there's still bad data, you know, being put out by bad leaders along with wrong information. Um, yeah. But, you know, the scientists don't, they're so busy trying to solve the problem that they're sharing data in a way they never have before. That's right. Uh, and we're, you know, and we're able to sequence this stuff faster than we ever have before, right? Within a month, we'd sequence the, the genome of this, mm -hmm. of this virus, you know, and we're coming up with tools to, uh, to halt it uh, in extraordinarily rapid ways. So. Hmm. All right. I'm going to ask one follow-up question, Rian. I'm not letting you talk. But <laughs> I, I've got to leave and Jane here, and there, there's so much <laughs> yeah, intelligence I can't resist. Um, all right, so my next question is, uh, and they're slightly different. Jane, you're seeing I, what I'm wondering is because a lot of people are trying to figure out how do I future proof my business? How do I, you know, this is very personal for a lot of people on the economic front. So, Jane, on your side, I want to know the companies you're seeing that are responding the best that are really kind of starting to thrive and pivoting and really getting busy. I want to know if you're, if you see there any commonalities in their DNA and then Salim, of course, you've been future proofing organizations at a really high level for a little while now. Same question back at you. I'm, you know, in exponential organizations, you kind of lay out 10, 10 properties that, that exponential companies have. What I'm wondering is, of those, are there certain things that you're seeing that people are re are really turning out to be advantages? And of course, I didn't really explain scale and ideas very clearly. So why don't you do that also? So Jane, what would you? Why don't you start us off? That's right. a really good question because you know a lot of people are going to put a lot of energy 
and not come up with answers. So winning, you know, is like really depends on how you define winning. Um, so there's that. But what I think is is really interesting about, you know, growing up in the digital revolution, you know, I thought I understood risk. Uh, and then I moved into the biotech world. And it's like risk times 100 or times 1,000, you know, because technology is built zeros and ones. And, you know, there are algorithms and that's kind of the way things go. And life sciences are messy and there's just so much we don't understand. And, you know, just when you think you understand the genome, then it's like, oh, but the genome is actually coding the proteome, you know, and the proteome is, you know, involved with the signalome. And then there's the immunome and the virome. And, you know, it's like the microbiome, all these things interact with each other in ways that we just really haven't figured out yet. And there's also a really interesting thing I won't get into, but it's um, it's the fact that biology cheats. Digital code cheats too, but, you know, you find things doing unpredictable things in unpredictable ways to achieve a goal that would otherwise have taken us a long time to get there. So anyway, my point is that the risk profiles are pretty high. And I think the leaders of the organizations that have been able to most successfully pivot uh, and find a way to contribute to this, this battle are the ones that are comfortable managing an ambiguity. They're ones who have an ability to say, these are the things we don't know. These are the things we do know. We are gonna go here full bore but we're not going to do so in a way that locks us into a particular strategy, you know, which doesn't mean we have no strategy. It means we haven't built guardrails, you know, and I look at some of the companies like, uh, like Zymergen, for instance, here in, uh, in the East Bay in Emeryville, California, um, you know, they're the way they tool their operation, you know, these are capital intensive companies. They have very large expense, you know, a, a sequencing machine costs millions of dollars, but what they do is everything is on a cart. You know, and so everything is modular and they can tool up for a particular approach to a disease or, or, uh, or a drug or what have you. But it's nothing is, you know, I came from a chocolate factory, you know, everything was bolted to the ground and it took us, you know, two years to build. And it's like, I'm just so impressed with how quickly uh, they can move. It's like a museum, you know, that doesn't build stationary walls. They build temporary walls that can be moved around or torn down or repainted or whatever. It's uh, I think that's probably the single most common element I would see. Salim, what do you think? So this is obviously right in my wheelhouse around the the uh, the book and the way we thought about it. The whole premise for the book was was a metabolism problem and a flexibility agility problem. So when I was running kind of one week programs at Singularity with AD CEOs, investors, government leaders, at the end of the week we would get this question: Okay, you've disrupted me. I get that. I got the disruption. What the hell do I do on Monday, right? Um, and the 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 book was an answer to that. And we basically analyzed. We noticed that over the last decade, we've been building organizations in a completely different way than we've ever seen before. Looked at 200 unicorns and did a year and a half of analytical research to see how they were doing it. How was Uber growing so fast or Facebook or Airbnb and others and came up with the, the EXO model, which is um, inductive. It's kind of defining and labeling what's already out there. We didn't create the model and it's making sense now across the world. I just heard from John Mackey the CEO of Whole Foods that he's a huge fan has been using some of the models in his work. Um, when you when the model basically says that that uh, there's a fundamental economic new model that's coming out in how we build businesses, and I'll just take a minute to describe it if I could. Um, and you know when you're running a business, we're about demand and supply, and specifically what's the cost of demand, what's the cost of supply. Hopefully you're on the right side of that equation. The internet came along and for the first time in business history, it allowed us to exponentially drop the cost of demand. Online marketing, referral marketing, every Silicon Valley company is trying for a viral loop, in which case your acquisition costs go to zero. Um, and that's the first time in history you could acquire customers at no cost, which is amazing. Um, and so that's great and now we have a big phenomena. But on the supply side, what exponential organizations or EXOs as we call them for short, have figured out is how do you drop the cost to supply exponentially. So you think about the uh, Airbnb, the marginal cost of adding a room to their inventory is pretty much zero. Whereas if you're high, you have to build a hotel, right? Now we have hordes of startup entering legacy industries with no marginal cost of supply, and that's an existential threat to the incumbent. So now what do you do if you're in the incumbent is your metabolism is geared towards decade-long products and services rollouts 
is Jane mentioned in the medical industry, it's almost 20 years to go from known cure to full deployment. It used to be 250 years, by the way, so we're better at 17 years, but still a long way to go. Uh, now there's a huge opportunity for new companies to, to explode out of the gate as, as we're seeing. The challenge for legacy companies is their metabolism is too slow. In, the, in Jack Welch, in his annual report in the year 2000 for GE, said the minute the metabolism of your company gets slower than the outside world, you're dead. The only question is when. I would argue that the metabolism of most big companies is slower than the outside world. So we've now been working on tool sets for how to increase that metabolism. And the way we do it is we run a 10-week program inside a large company called an EXO Sprint, which hacks culture at scale and moves leadership culture management thinking three years ahead in 10 weeks. And we open source that methodology in the second book. Um, and basically the attributes you need are running a series of small, low-cost experiments at the edge, testing new business models, new technologies, new um, uh, uh, customer channels, et cetera. And then you double down when you see success. And internally, you need to upgrade radically the use of data, uh, building a community, creating an MTP, a massive purpose for your company or your brand, uh, and then changing the format of the mothership. In your TED talk, you do a great job of the analogy around the immune system of big organizations and how it fights back against innovation. I'm just curious if you could break that down for folks along with elaborating a little more on the metabolism idea in relation to that. Sure. Um, I, in fact, all of my work now is based on this problem. Uh, um, so in the first book, Exponential Organizations, we focused on the, the characteristics of EXOs and the characteristics of fast growing companies. Um, but we spend a big chunk saying, how would you retrofit this into a legacy organization? And this comes from my time at Yahoo. I was the head of innovation there running their incubator. And you have this massive immune system problem. Though you try something really disruptive and the antibodies come and the mothership hates you, right? And you could expect that in a bank or an old telco, but Yahoo is less than 10 years old. Why should it have this problem? And that blew my mind and I was stuck thinking about that. Um, and as we started advising big companies, it turned out they all have an immune system problem. Uh, once you're over about 100 people, and it reduces the speed. And this is a huge challenge in, in terms of how we architect organizations growing going forward. Now, it's bad in the private sector and in corporates, but it's even worse in the public sector. And I think this is where the real work needs to be done. Because in the public sector, the existing policy is the immune system. Uh, bankers are fighting Bitcoin. Taxis are fighting Uber. Academics have about the worst immune system I've ever seen. Maybe religion is the ultimate immune system. Um, and now... You, you well, the, orthodox, the orthodoxy You're in right. every religion is desperately You're trying right. to maintain that line, right? And saying, we're not changing. Right. It doesn't matter what the external world says. We are not changing. We figured it out and that's it. We're, that's the line. And we're Amish and we're staying this way for 600 years. And the work with, you, with my ecosystem now is a small private practice that does these 10 week sprints for big companies. And so we have for-profit, non-profit immune, uh, immune system attack process frameworks and a community of consultants that's about 4,000 people around the world. So both you and Jane talked about flexibility and adaptability. And, and really, you know, it's funny because I listened to you, Salim, I listened to you, Jane, the skunk works model, which has been essentially how major American, major world global companies have innovated for the past hundred years, whether it's Lockheed Martin who invented it, Apple, um, who used it, Walmart, take your pick. Um, it's the rules seem to be the same. You can't innovate in the center of an organization, move it to the, move the innovation lab to the edge, make them very autonomous. And in a sense, listening to Jane talk about the organizations that are, that are, that are really working. It sounds like they're being run like skunk works, even if they're top down organizations at this point, I think that's accurate. Or do you think there's more going on than kind of updated skunk works for the 21st century? It's more a little more going on. You have, There's a very specific architecture for what works. And uh, Larry Page came to me a few years ago and said, hey, your unit at Yahoo is successful. Should I do that at Google? And I said, no, no, you'll have this immune system problem, but take your teams to the edge, do something interesting, go into adjacent spaces, and for God's sakes, keep it stealth, keep it low under the radar, okay? And if you do those two things, have the skunk works go into adjacent spaces it gives the immune system less of a surface area to attack. So when you say adjacent spaces, this is like Apple going from whatever their core business is into healthcare or payments or, right, so really an adjacent yeah. business. 
Yeah, exactly. Or Google going into cars, right? Um, a totally different, still a data gathering exercise, but uh, the real reason they're in transportation is, is, yeah, they're like autonomous cars, but each Google car is collecting a gigabyte of data per second per car. Right. So that's really exactly. interesting for them. Uh, they're you know, if you move your flower pot on your windsill, winds, windowsill, Google will know um, uh, in the future. And so now uh, they were mapping the world in real time, and that's really interesting from that perspective. And so the, I talked to Larry and I said, this would be how I would think about it. And Google X is the result of that. The master of this technique is indeed Apple. And not because they have a great design capability or a great supply chain, but the fact that the way they operate is they will take a small team that's really disruptive, take that team to the edge of the organization, keep them completely stealth and secret, and they will say to them, go disrupt another industry, mm -hmm. right? Literally nobody does this and nobody's even noticed that this is what they do. So they have a portfolio of teams looking at different industries and they go into it and there's no limit to their market cap. Uh, and I think that's the model that more and more other companies will have to follow this kind of portfolio approach. I completely agree with you, Salim. And uh, I'm sitting here listening to you thinking, you know, the people who I think I are at the down. bleeding <laughs> edge, the people that I see having the most um, success are success. the people who are willing to go be, uh, so I have a friend who started out as a neuroscientist and the age of 50 retrained as a geneticist and is now doing groundbreaking work in some of the least sexy aspects of medicine, which is um, basically translational medicine, which is taking the results from the lab and deploying them in the clinic to see what the clinical results can be. Uh, and so in his case, his name is Dr. Robert Green, um, and what he's doing is sequencing uh, patients and then using that information in a clinical setting in order to show, you know, basically the FDA and the AMA and, and so forth, how clinicians will use the information and why we should switch now to sequencing all patients, including at birth. Um, and I think part of what enabled him to do that was jumping from one very deep silo because, you know, genetics and neuroscience are completely siloed. They're just on opposite sides of the campus and they don't have time to talk to each other because there's so many developments um, in their fields all the time. Oh, so they need, yeah. And I, you know, I have a great example, a woman named um, Angela Belcher, uh, you know, who was an electrical engineer at MIT. And, you know, she took um, technology that she'd been working on uh, around nanotubules and was able to uh, walk into an operating theater for, for oncology surgery and say, oh, you know, I can figure out how to shine light on that tumor so that as you're, as the surgeon is excising the tumor, they can actually see, I can light up what the edges of that tumor are so that you can see that you- Oh, she was on. working on ovarian cancer. Right, exactly. That's right. She yeah, was, amazing, really amazing, cool amazing. work. Yeah, 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 really amazing and it, work. It takes that beginner's eye, you know, um, and it takes multiple skill sets. And I think that's where we've come. You know, professors today tell me their students are smarter than they could ever possibly imagine. And it's because they've grown up with access to all the world's information and, you know, the right. expectation that they would master far greater amounts of, of knowledge and, and experience. And of course, they're getting it not just from academics, they're getting it from, you know, all these other inputs as well. And so they are primed to be experts um, or at least to have a passing knowledge um, of a lot of different fields. And if they don't, they can just, you know, look it up on YouTube. This is a really profound point. You know, major breakthroughs happen when you cross disparate areas, right? And and what, what I remember getting super excited by the model that Peter and Ray initially put together for Singularity University was you get the smartest young people in the world, you give them exposure to the fastest growing technologies, and then you point them at the biggest problems. Right, something interesting will happen as you swirl that around. And we've seen kind of incredible things come. And each of those intersections of biotech and, and neuroscience or AI and sensors yields a whole new explosion of new applications mm -hmm. and products. And the way I frame it now is that we have 20 Gutenberg moments hitting us at the same mm -hmm. time. In, in the 15th century, the one invention, the printing press, uh, fundamentally changed the world. Now we have uh, uh, solar energy, just that changes the world completely, or blockchain changes the world, CRISPR changes the world completely. And I think we have 20 of them ha happening at the same time. Mm -hmm. And the challenge now in the work that I think we need to focus on globally is we need to absorb these technologies and bring them to play better uh, than we have in the past. Yeah, you know, it's, it's interesting. I think um, at the, you know, I've been looking at the environmental side of, of, of the exponential tech equation, and I've spent a long time thinking about that. 
But I think the same lessons sort of apply, which is the real breakthroughs we need sort of everywhere are at the systems level. How do we shift culture? And I never, ever, ever talk about shifting culture because it's so far out of our lane as what we do as peak performance experts. But how do you bring in systems level thinking at a cultural level? Um, there's a bunch of ways of doing it. The, the best one we found is the use of narrative. And you look at how, you know, the, the, most of the technologists and so on were inspired by 30 years of science fiction writing. And then, then subconsciously as a culture, we then realized those inventions, uh, people are looking for breakthroughs in other ways. Uh, unfortunately, we've lost that, that tradition. Now it's kind of Marvel movies. The tip of the spear is, is, is narrative. Uh, and then behind that flows all of the artifacts that come from that the expression of different things. And then we decide where our values want to sit. And then we uh, enforce those. Legal systems are basically just society's wishes uh, and society's uh, desires formalized into legal systems uh, and ethical, uh, ethical systems formalized as legal systems. And now we can bring those into a different realm because of what I mentioned at the beginning. We can now build systems that are based on trust rather than mistrust. Uh, Jerry Mikulski, uh, one of our friends in the Bay Area, uh, well known to a lot of us, has made this amazing comment. He said, "Scarcity equals abundance minus trust." Right? It's one of those you have to like think about it for like an hour. And <laughs> he's right. If we're, and if you think of almost all government systems, whether it's checking your government ID, rat, giving you a passport, they're based on mistrust, and then they start from there. Right? Mm -hmm. Now, if you have new systems like blockchain and others, or scalable trust systems, like I mentioned at the beginning, and you can embed that right in the system. Now you can layer amazing applications of this. And we have actually a precedent with the internet on this. And if you want, I can go into that, but we don't have to go into that right now. Well, I, you know, as a, as a storyteller publisher, I'm obviously going to say narrative as well. <laughs> uh, and I was thinking, well, what, my, what would my twist on that be? And it's like, you know, gamification in a sense, right? Because, you know, we're all experiencing the stories, we're all hearing them, but it's when you actually engage and enact and, and take what you're learning and in some way involve yourself. You know, it's, it's, it's been an amazing thing to watch, you know, how children learn, how, how they, you can change somebody's attitude about something with something as, you know, silly as, as a, as a game-based simulation. You know, it's like, sure, you can make those choices, but you know, if you put a power plant there, then in, in Sim City, you know, to take a very old example, you know, then you're not gonna get houses there and then you're not gonna get schools and then you're not gonna get cafes and you're not gonna have all that other stuff. But you know, the same thing, things like virtual reality, you know, is a way to create empathy. You know, it's not just narrative. At that point, you know, you're, you're engaged because you donned a headset, you entered into this environment. And so- um, I, I, I'm gonna throw out this, my dream, mayoral debate of the future is you have four candidates for mayor and they're all playing SimCity for like a day and you see how they do and you'll see who the candidate should be right there. How about president? Can we just do that with presidents? Not that hard. That's a great idea. Folks, we've got some great questions coming in. I don't know if you've been seeing them, but I, I'd love to throw a few out. But how can we be assured that the technological revolutions being discussed have a spiritual ethic, however we define that, so that human beings in the natural environment do not become irrelevant. I think it's it's incredibly necessary. You know, if we'd gone back in the 60s and had instrumented the coal-fired plants and the fossil fuel plants and knew what we were, the damage we were doing to the climate, we might have done things very differently. And the technologies we have today are billions of times more powerful than they were 20 years ago. And so when we have see people building systems of these new technologies, for God's sakes, instrument the hell out of them. Uh, and we've done actually a pretty good job. In the in the 70s, the biotech uh, world got together and created the Asilomar guidelines and said, if you have an infectious substance and you spill it, what should you have at hand to clean it up? Who should you call? How do you uh, secure the, the area, et cetera, et cetera. And we've not had a major accident in 40 years. And that kind of systemic thinking, again, back to the earlier point of think through the, the systemic implications of when things go wrong or not, means that you can actually do things very powerfully. I'm a huge, obviously, technology optimist from the point of view that technology is a major driver of progress in the world. And frankly, it might be the only major driver of progress we've ever had, and by far the most powerful. 
Um, now we have a dozen technologies accelerating, gets us super excited about where the world is going. The big challenge is how, how do you extract the promise without the peril, right, of it? Mm -hmm. And we've done a pretty good job up till now. We've, we've extracted incredible amounts of value from the steam engine and from um, machines and engines and fossil fuels, et cetera. Now we have to take in the whole cost of it. And I was talking to a guy called Lawrence Bloom, who uh, gave me the best kind of metaphor for how to think about the transition the world is going through right now. He said, think about a, a rocket in multiple stages going into Earth. You have the big fat booster rocket that's blowing energy out the back end and then getting you out of Earth, Earth orbit. And once it's there, you de jettison that, that big fat horrible rocket and you have a much smaller, more elegant craft that takes you to the next level. And we're kind of at that inflection point where capitalism and fossil fuels and so on have gotten us to this incredible point uh, and now we need to jettison that and come up with new, a lighter, more elegant, structured craft for where we're going. And mm -hmm. when I think about the human spirit, um, we're in a very, we're very, very close to being able to cover the bottom two or three layers of Maslow's hierarchy uh, using technology, uh, lifespan, uh, better healthcare, better education, et cetera. And now more people can spend their time on the high order thinking. Mm -hmm. And when we've studied technologies, and when you study societies in the past, the reach abundance, uh, the Romans or the, uh, the the Aryans taking over India or the whatever, they tend to do four activities, sex, music, uh, food, and art, uh, not in that order. Yes, I, I completely agree with you that technology has been, you know, probably the single most important driver of progress across the centuries. Um, you know, our ability to make tools, our ability and desire to shape, you know, even the way our tongues and palates evolved that allowed us to make a wide variety of differentiated sounds which enabled us to communicate more complex higher order thinking you know that's a technology as well and you know the fact that we learned to read you know reshaped our brains you know that the fact that we are now absorbing huge amounts of information from multiple sources you know with with plastic minds you know is again another order of magnitude of acceleration in advance and so the question is not, do we have the technologies, but which technology should we deploy? And, you know, I don't think we've ever consciously said, oh yes, let's build that and not that, you know? I mean, the Manhattan Project said, well, we, we could not build this uh, because we know this is gonna be a horrible technology. On the other hand, we have to build this because it's going to stop the war. Um, and so, you know, I, I feel like we have another, moment like a Silomar, you know, they were talking about recombinant DNA back in the 70s. And it's like, yeah. what are the models that we can look to that are being experimented with today that can help give us a sense of how to choose technologies and how to deploy them in ways that preserve and enhance our humanity as opposed to enslave us? You know, we've run the world for the last few hundred years on a very male archetype top-down command and control hierarchical systems like Judeo-Christian religions and the military industrial complex and the corporation and so on. And again, it's that big booster rocket that got us to a certain point. But now you see the rise of the Burning Man, the maker movement, the DIY movement, open source, et cetera. And we're moving to a much more collaborative, peer-to-peer, -peer, nurturing, participatory environment. That's a much more of a female archetype. And the problem right. we have today is as we meet abundance, the male archetype, when it meets abundance, relates to it as power and tries to hoard it. Uh, Wall Street money, Middle East oil. Uh, the female archetype, when it meets abundance, shares it around, which we, when we see information on the internet, we share it around. Um, and so we need to move to the female archetype uh, and the characteristics of that archetype as we move more and more towards abundance, which is what technology is delivering for us. So the, so the technology is not the concern, it's the way in which technological evolution is, is happening you can't be over yeah exactly concept. yeah exactly right you know uh, um you have the open versus closed argument right with open source versus closed and over time open source always wins but you always get people building mm -hmm. an amazing system and then trying to put words walls around it not letting anybody else in and then the open source for people fight back and we go back and forth in we ratchet back and forth between open and closed systems and we've seen that throughout the history of the internet for example the, this is the huge challenge, I think, now that at a global systemic level, we have to move towards a more female archetype around this. And a lot of folks like John Hagel and others have been talking about this for quite a while. Mm -hmm. 
anything to say on that, Jen? I've got a, another question. Yeah. I was just thinking about this company, Geeko Bioworks, um, you know, which is they, they call themselves, I think, either the enzyme company or the organism company or whatever. They're based in Boston. They're a quadricorn, still a private company. But, um, you know, they were founded um, by a group of people out of MIT who were really like the first people to to think and, and actually build a company around synthetic biology. So they announced a twenty five million dollar uh, opening up of their platform. Uh, to allow uh, anybody who has you know, got a, a scalable solution to come on. So they're giving away $25 million worth of, of value, essentially. Um, so everything from manufacturing nucleic acid-based vaccines, antibody-based therapeutics, point-of-care diagnostics, they're doing all of this in an open source way. They are sharing all of the research that comes out of it. They're not claiming any IP. They're giving away $25 million worth of value. And it's a really smart business move. So I think they will find the smartest, most dynamic teams. You know, those teams will be using, you know, Ginkgo's platforms. Uh, and I think these are the ways that we can demonstrate value creation uh, with a, an abundance mindset. You know, it's like these problems are so big that if you give away a little piece of it, you know, there's still plenty for everybody to, to <laughs> I think it also, it's, it, I love your female, you know, archetypes, absolutely. But I also like the sort of abundance mentality. You know, hmm. there's, there's so many big problems to, to chew on and there's so much room for every smart person and every smart team and every kind of technological solution. So I think we need that. Great. Just to close the loop on that, Celine, because people are finding it fascinating, that, that sort of masculine, feminine way of, of contextualizing things. Any resources? For folks on that to dive deeper that are that are again evidence-based and, and reliable um i did a I, i'll give you a great one you know when the eo wilson documents this little uh, case study of genet around genetics so in central america you have fire ants and they have hives and they war against each other and there's just unbelievable carnage and violence because they're fighting over scant resources and they they were kind of predominantly in central america and then they moved into the u.s and they found abundance they literally change their genetics. And in the US, fire ants don't fight each other, they collaborate. Yeah. And right there, you see nature figuring it out. And we're sitting here going, oh, we have abundance, let's fight over it. I mean, it's just mind boggling that we can't bring that kind of intelligence to the fore. Uh, and so I think there's lots of areas where we can, this is cultural anthropology in a sense, writ large. If you look at um, throughout history, we've gone, we've gone back and forth between the male and female archetype to go through progress. Feudal systems were very top-down structures where power aggregated, and then democracy came and broke that up. Now we've got corporate structures trying to actually break down democracy, which is what's been happening, uh, and take power there. And we'll go, now we have the open source movement uh, coming along. The thing that is a, the killer in this and breaks this cycle and moves us permanently into this is the sheer democratization of all of these technologies. As Peter and uh, Stephen write in Abundance, the six Ds, the, the democratization means that anybody has access to these technologies. And this is super important because throughout the history of our world, it's always been true that advanced technologies cost a lot. And only a big government could afford to do R&D, produce new products and services, the pharma world in its, in, its, in its traditional state, et cetera. But today, for the first time in human history, advanced technologies are really inexpensive. You know, CRISPR is pretty inexpensive. Gene sequencing is now incredibly inexpensive. Solar energy is inexpensive. The blockchain is open source and free. And now it means that anybody can innovate. And I'll give a very specific example. In, there was a fishing village in Vietnam where once a month a big ship used to arrive to de deliver diesel fuel for their fishing boat. Then the ship stopped coming and all of a sudden they have no ability to, to fuel their boats and they're stuck. What do they do? So one of them looks on the internet, orders a solar panel looks up instructions, puts a solar panel on the canopy of the boat, uh, connects it to the propeller and puts in the little capacitors and whatever, and they've invented a solar power boat. So now here you have cutting edge innovation using just super cutting edge technologies at the edge of civilization that costs literally nothing. That kind of example we're gonna see an explosion of, uh, and that's why this is unstoppable. And this is why we're going to move to this. The only question is how, and how do we do the regulatory and mitigation of that? Do you see maker nurses who are engineering these, you know, just 
they're desperate. And I think desperation breeds, you know, incredible innovation, you know, or people in the third world, developing countries who are having to deal with this, you know, what is the least um, expensive, easiest to get, you know, method of protecting somebody from spreading the, the vaccine. You know, the other thing I was going to say is, I think this pandemic is giving us a moment to reflect on how connected we all are. And as we do that, we realize that everything we are doing with our society, from the, the food that we put in our mouths to the energy that we are using, it all affects our health. And as my grandmother used to say, if you don't have your health, you don't have anything. Mm -hmm. And so by shred shredding all the rest of the stuff and bringing it down to, am I safe? Am I healthy? You know, and, and what are the things that will make me less safe and less healthy? It's like bad air, you know, um, un, unhealthy living conditions, et cetera. So now is a chance to see how all of these systems work together, how our food systems and our medical systems and our energy systems and um, our waste removal or lack of waste removal, how they all work together. So I think we have a, a big opportunity mm -hmm. here. So there's a lot of folks on and who will be watching this for business owners. Uh, a lot of whom are, are small business owners. Stephen and I were at the Singularity University campus not too long ago for the launch of the Future Spas and Think. And one of the things Peter said that really caught me was that in the, within the next 20 years, there's going to be two kinds of companies. It's going to be AI companies and bankrupt companies. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and so what would all of you say to the folks out there who have businesses who are watching this who do not who are not within tech who do have a marginal cost of replication for whatever their services are around pivoting around thinking about the future in general and around what to do on monday you know you know <clears throat> kevin kelly made this amazing point in uh, one of his books where he said the next 10,000 plan business plans you're going to take a domain and add ai to it I think the the what's going to happen is as each of these technologies become uh, kind of fundamental um, 3D printing or others, will it'll become part of the infrastructure of any company. It's the making things, building things, etc. Just like if you have a web, uh, if you're building a website now, there's so many capabilities that are all now built in that you can throw one up very very quickly. And each time we add a new capability to the layer, it amplifies the the overall capability into a really profound capability. And this adds the, to the zeitgeist of innovation, which is hurtling forward super fast. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm just looking forward to transitioning from you know, industrial manufacturing to biological manufacturing. You know, if, once we can see how much faster, you know, fewer inputs, less water, less land, less pesticides and, and herbicides, um, you know, the ability to just translate a file, download the file, 3D print it there. I mean, you know, there's a huge opportunity here um, and we're not that far away from it. Hmm. I just want to ask you one quick question, Jane, on that note, which is just, if you could um, backtrack this a little bit, explain the neobiological revolution a little, I think folks oh, find that really interesting. Sure. Well, so my kids are um, almost 21 and 23, which means that they grew up to live what we talked about when we launched Wired back in 1993, which was, you know, the digital revolution, they learned from video games, you know, as much as from school, you know, they, they've never had a sense of boundaries to what they were interested in, good at, or had access to. And so, you know, the question then, and, and, and of course we've seen the economic disruption over the course of the last 25 years, um, we've seen industries disrupted. We've seen, you know, command structures flattened. We've seen, um, you know, information coming from all different places and power, you know, being distributed. And so we kind of understand that curve now. We kind of know what that innovation disruption curve looks like. And so I started thinking, you know, A, because I got tired of thinking about click-through rates, but um, B, because I just got involved in other things. I started making chocolate and that got me thinking about you know, the food that we eat and the way we work with farmers and the way farmers engage, you know, with that process, the, the fair trade, the organic, you know, all of that. But then also food as um, as a nutraceutical, you know, uh, as a carrier of other nutraceuticals, um, sacred plants, all that sort of thing. Um, and I just started thinking about what the next stage of the digital revolution was, you know, because if it's 
I know social media, I mean, blockchain definitely, um, but where, where does it take us? And suddenly I had um, some crises uh, in my family. I had three octogenarians who suddenly became my responsibility. And um, so I ended up going to guess where? Singularity University. Um, and I, I learned, you know, what exponential medicine was all about. And I just had this shocking moment where I realized it's so much like the world as I saw it in 1991, you know, and I looked at the people in the room who weren't just PhDs in neuroscience or, you know, molecular biology or, or genetic engineering, you know, they were also hackers. They also had to have these digital skills. And the fact that they could do that in my mind made them the most powerful people in the world. And they all had visions and dreams of where they could go and what they could do. And all of a sudden I thought, it's another revolution. And so I decided to call it a neo-biological revolution. And, you know, interestingly, my colleague at Wired, Kevin Kelly, had written a book. He was writing a book when we launched Wired and he took a sabbatical from the whole earth catalog to write his book. He took a sabbatical from his book to help us launch Wired. And then mm-hmm. we launched it, he went back to finish his book and went on book tour and then ultimately came back to Wired. But, um, the original subtitle of his book, Out of Control, which if you haven't read it, it's still amazing, uh, as is everything Kevin produces. Uh, but the subtitle was Fast Forward into Neobiological Civilization. And I picked it up again, and I realized that the stuff he'd been writing about 25 years ago is now available to us. You know, we've sequenced the genome, we can now edit the genome, and we're working on creating synthetic genomes. Um, you know, we've got emergent systems that we can harness, you know, we can reprogram, yes, viruses, yes, algae and bacteria uh, and fungus. Uh, We can see inside the brain, we can see inside the body and we can harness those biological systems, not only for for our own personal health, but also for new materials, for new energy sources, um, for new agricultural processes. And so that's my focus now. I'm fascinated by biological systems. I'm super motivated by my own personal health. I'm terrified of, you know, cognitive decline. I'm also terrified of the effect of cognitive decline on our society and our economy and on our families, you know, because I was sandwich generation with kids at home and, you know, three octogenarians 2,500 miles away with a combination of cognitive decline and mental health. And it's like the mental health crisis in our country and around the world is, is shocking. Um, and so, you know, huge loss of productivity, but more to the point, you know, it's the loss of the will to live. And, yeah. you know, maybe a lot of that's being driven by our 24 seven culture, our, you know, dominance of, of economic incentives uh, and our overwhelming amount of technology that we haven't evolved sociological relationships with yet. You know, the fact that people have to be told to put your device down, you know, it's making you crazy is, is I think people in 50 years will look back on us and go, wow, why did you, it was sort of like, reminds me of the turn of the century when everybody was drunk because there was no clean water. Um, (laughs) We look at that now, it's like they were drunk all day long. How did they get anything done? It's like, we were stressed all day long because of the number of notifications coming in from all these different platforms and our, you know, our podcasting platforms sucked and were stressful and, you know, <laughs> to work out with, you know, stressful apps. And, you know, I have to hire somebody to take my Fitbit for a walk so I can get enough you know, <laughs> steps in today. So anyway, I just wanted to capture the stories. Um, I wanted to know what the technologies were. I wanted to know who the people are. And I especially wanted to be involved as we harness these godlike tools that will transform our species and our planet and our relationship among all of the species on this planet, what are our values? Where are our heuristics? What is it that we want to build? And how are we going to live this neobiological revolution differently than we lived the digital revolution? What lessons are there for us to take away? You know, how can we collectively put forth visions for this future that we are building towards. And part of the problem is uh, the life sciences are very siloed. They're very complicated. And if you know one thing in one field, it doesn't mean you have the bandwidth to follow another one. And I think that could um, lead to us, you know, coming up with lots of different solutions, like, you know, the the Betamax and um, 
Uh, what was the other one? <laughs> I don't even remember anymore. That's such an old example. I think we need to put forward where we want to evolve to. And this isn't something that we will collectively agree. All homo sapiens on planet Earth agree this is what we want. You know, it's like different cultures, different socioeconomic groups, different nations, different tribes. You know, people are going to have their own ideas about where this should be, which is why there will be this profusion of diversity and abundance um, going forward. But it starts with mindfulness. It starts with conversation, it starts with education, and it starts with um, understanding what's possible, which is why I have this book that we just published, 25 Visions for the Future of Our Species. Just to build on that, Jane, so it seems like Singularity University has had a huge impact or interrelationship with everyone here, including Stephen. One of the big things that Peter talks about in Singularity in general is the idea of people having a massively transformative purpose or an MTP. I'm curious what all of your thoughts are around developing an MTP, a massively transformative purpose in general, but then especially out of this current time of adversity, because I think it can be quite a good time to really get clear on what actually matters. And as you're saying, Jane, a line around some kind of intention or mission. When we examined these uh, EXOs and looked at the rise of them, it, it, it was the one common attribute across all of them. They all had an MTP. So we came up with the phrase massive transformative purpose to describe this this new thing, like Google organized the world's information, et cetera. We found that everyone had it because in a period of hyper growth, it's, it focuses attention and uh, allows you to do great hiring and retention. In fact, we're starting to see you, you'll hire people based on alignment of the company and the individual's MTV. Right? Um, and now most projects are getting launched uh, with this phenomenon in mind. We did a project for uh, uh, some big companies and now we're starting to see brands morph their brand promises to MTPs. Uh, and so that's kind of getting uh, more popular. For us, when we look at it, it's kind of existential and important to go forward with, with something like that for any project that you do, because it sets the, the, the kind of the pinpoint in the future horizon, defines the moonshots along the way that you want to get to. And mm. it, and you kind of take on, and it doesn't have to be that you want to, you know, go to Mars. It can be simply be, I'm going to transform the shaving industry and you have Dollar Shave Club, right? Uh, which is a dollar a month for shaving or whatever their thing is. And so <laughs> that becomes really powerful into to the framing of this. Then, that, then you kind of put in all the instruments that allow you to get there and build your, your vehicle to allow you to get there. So uh, Jane and Salim, I want to be sensitive to both of your time. I know we've, you've already been with us for uh, well over an hour now. So I've got two more quick questions for well, all three of you. One of the things people come to us with as a challenge is being caught in the machine of their business. And they're often told that in order to get leverage, they need to build systems and processes and procedures. What's the threshold or cutoff point where that leads to bureaucracy rather than efficiency, and then ends up starving innovation. And you mentioned, Salim, 100 people is, is obviously some kind of rough indicator, but I'm wondering if you'd say a little bit more about that. So yeah, it, it doesn't have to do with really the size, because if you set the right structure in place, you can scale um, uh, infinitely to this in this model. Uh, I'll give you a really profound example that's really dramatic. There's a Chinese appliance manufacturer called Hair, H-A-I-E-R. They make 55 million fridges and ovens a year, 80,000 people. Uh, and they used to be or organized in a top-down classic hierarchical uh, pyramid structure. And one day the CEO looked at the org structure and decided, I can't keep meet my corporate goals this way. Blew it up. Turned 80,000 people into 2,000 autonomous teams of about 40 people each. Uh, each team elects their own leader. Each team has a PNL. And most crazy, each team decides whatever they want to do. Now, that's insane. You go to any business school in the world and say, I want to make 55 million fridges, and they'll tell you you need a ton of centralized product strategy, demand forecasting, inventory management, et cetera, et cetera. No, they don't. Who knew, right? And the, the challenge that we have is we have to unlearn 50 years of MBA thinking, which is geared almost exclusively towards having companies that are efficient and predictable. Um, and this is what John Hagel has talked about a lot in his work. Now we need companies that are agile, uh, flexible, fast, and, and kind of decentralized to be able to react quickly and they're adaptable, okay? 
And this requires a decentralized group where the teams kind of decide what they want to do. And if you look at the modern team companies like the Apples, the Googles, the LinkedIn's, the Facebooks, the Twitters, they all use OKRs or objectives and key results as the mechanism to do human performance measurement and team performance measurement, which is better than the old quarterly uh, things. And God help us if you're doing stack rankings or 360s and stuff, the really old stuff. And so now we have totally new models that we can use to really scale these, these, and then if you have a massive transformative purpose and everybody's aligned towards that, when these guys at hire want to decide what features should go into a new fridge, instead of having a market research team looking at focus groups, they 2,000 teams are voting, right? And they're all interacting with customers, suppliers, manufacturers, and, and, and vendors and partners, and the resulting outcome is way, way better than the way they used to do it. And it totally boggles the mind. It's a really fabulous little experiment. Go to any uh, business school manufacturing professor and show him what hire is doing, and it'll just it'll break his mind. It'll just break their mind. <laughs> that, I think it's really helpful. So, so it's essentially, when designing your organization, you use much more cutting edge, more recent organizational design principles like yeah, lean, scrum, sprints, design thinking, that that kind of thing, because they foster innovation much more. It sounds like. Yeah, exactly. I mean, you have to have it foster innovation and then embrace uncertainty, embrace the taking of risk, uh, live a little bit on the edge, ne always never being sure. And then the minute you, the, the idea is to get to what we you would call a, a constantly learning organization, right? And where you're nonstop learning and feeding the results back towards the core mm -hmm. for new ideas, new inputs, et cetera. And you can't ever stop, especially in a fast paced uh, world, that, that becomes the harder bit. And if you think about, like for example, Amazon, for every team in Amazon is asking the question, how many experiments did you run this quarter? How many succeeded? How many failed? And if you're not running enough experiments and not enough are failing, you're not pushing the boundaries enough. My favorite policy is, is Amazon's policy that they call the, uh, the institutional yes. So they created a, a, a policy where if you come to me inside Amazon with an idea, my default answer has to be yes. If I want to say no, I have to write a two-page thesis on why it's a bad idea and post it publicly on the internet. So they've created friction and embarrassment to saying no, meaning that many more ideas get tested. Because it's way easier for me to say, yeah, just go do it before I, otherwise I have to write a two-page thing and I have to think about it, right? That many more ideas get tested. One of the results of this policy was Amazon Web Services, one of the most successful and profitable products in business history, created because nobody could figure out how to say no to it. Because in today's world, you don't know until you actually do it. And if you build it in to the procedures, the KPIs, the uh, communication patterns, et cetera, it becomes part of the skeletal fabric of that company. And part of the culture. Yeah. It's, it's so fascinating. We can go deeper on it at some other point, but how these kind of top-down organizational policies map very tightly to what you could call kind of bottom-up individual flow triggers, like Stephen posted in the comments there, that an institutional yes involves a flow trigger called yes and, which Keith Sawyer talks about. That's right. Group genius. That's right. In, fact, in fact, where we've kind of really we geek out uh, uh, in discussions is that uh, an exponential organization is an organization that, that by the design of it keeps the entire organization in a flow state. Mm, yeah, I love that. That's fascinating. Um, Jane, do you, do you have anything to add on that? I've got one more question, uh, which I'd like to start with you on. If Go for it. So one of the other things we do a lot of is, is help people, again, individually deal with VUCA conditions, professionally, volatility, uncertainty, complexity, ambiguity. And I know you mentioned ambiguity. It's kind of a two-part two question, which, which goes off what you just said, Celine. But question one is how organizationally do you think, Jane, companies can design to thrive in VUCA? And then I'm curious as well, before, before we let both of you go, how both of you personally tackle um, that issue of just thriving within VUCA conditions and handling ambiguity effectively. Mm -hmm. So I have never worked in a large organization. The largest organization I've ever worked in is the one I built, which was Wired, which you know at its peak, I think we had about 385 people. So in terms of my personal experience, I'm limited. I've also not studied it in the same way that obviously, you know, Salim has and, and others who know way more about this than I do. So I can only address that as a tiny business owner <laughs> um, who started multiple companies. And um, to me, the most important thing is DNA. 
Um, you know, it's like, what is your mission? And it's amaz amazing to me how many people start companies and even, you know, successful companies where people don't really know the answer to that question. Mm -hmm. Because the more deeply you have embedded your DNA um, in the minds and hearts of the people that you're working with, um, the less confusion they actually have. Um, the confusion is not, why am I here today? Or what are we trying to accomplish? The confusion is, okay, what's happening outside and how can we respond to that? So I really think by starting with a really solid definition of who you are and why you're there, the what is the thing that keeps changing. But the who you are and why you're there, I mean, unless you're doing some massive pivot, you know, is where I've always tried to focus my attention in the companies that we're involved with. And that connects people back to, you know, their their massive uh, uh, purpose, the MTP. You know, it's, I agree with you. I think it's it's just foundational. Right now. Yeah, it's, it's why we defined the term was exactly that, is that in, in, in as we come into times that are increasingly volatile, you know, it, the, the half-life of a skill used to be like 30 years and now it's five right. years. So you have no idea. Not in the media so, business. Oh my God, it's five minutes in my world. It, it, exactly. I mean, you know, if, uh, and one of the observations we made at Singularity was that if you're doing a master's degree in uh, biotech or advanced robotics or, or neuroscience, literally by the time you finish your master's degree, you're out of date. Um, and that's unreal. Uh, and so this is, a, the, now the question becomes, and if this is true, if you think about your, your best colleagues or your employees, or they're the ones that learn the fastest. Right. And those are the most valuable people around you. And therefore, the if you writ large, that means that organizations that learn the fastest and are designed for it, going more into the Robert's world, which is what he's trying to do all the time, is have and build organizations that are learning better nonstop. By definition, you're going to be, because there's no strategy that gets to where you want to go. Uh, the, the world is changing too fast. By the time you've got a strategy, it's out of date. Yeah. So the other thing too is, is um, I mean, particularly coming back to the media question, you know, I, I was originally looking for people to help me on my team and, you know, people would say, well, I know this technology, but I don't know that one. It was like, oh, well, where are the people who know this stuff? And everybody was like, nobody knows this stuff. You know? <laughs> the, the skill is being able to find the app that you can quickly, you know, deploy. Uh, and but to not get wedded to that app, because there's going to be another one that comes along that obsoletes that, you know, literally in a month. You know, and so, and so that is the question: is um, how quickly can you dance? Yeah, yeah. It, um, there's a great book that that Stephen recommends uh, often called Range by David Epstein, and he, he gets into the idea of meta skills that that understand any specific skill on top that is of, and and this, it's the specifics that are obviously changing. Whereas if you get you know the, the fundamental pieces again, mm -hmm. the learning, the self awareness even things like the ability to get yourself into a flow state down, you're just much better equipped to thrive regardless of the specifics. So yeah, folks, well, listen, thanks a million for all your time. If what you've heard on Flow Research Collective Radio has been helpful, please consider doing us a solid and leaving us a review on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you are listening to this. Reviews help us connect to a wider audience so we can get these peak performance principles out to more people. Thank you.